before we get into this week's episode, I want to make a plug for Art Market Minute. This is Artnet News's new micro podcast hosted by Margaret Kerrigan, who's the site's news editor, Europe. It offers a weekly snapshot of essential art market news expertly compiled by the Artnet Pro editorial team. We think about the Harlem Renaissance and focusing on this particular neighborhood in uptown Manhattan, but we have artists who were not in Harlem, who were in San Francisco, right. who were in Chicago, who were in Jamaica, who were also caught up in part of this movement. I'm Ben Davis, and this is The Art Angle, the podcast from Artnet News, where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. The words, the Harlem Renaissance, have immense magnetism for vast numbers of people. In art history, however, the Harlem Renaissance has often been treated as a footnote to the main story of 20th century art. It's often been given scant attention in textbooks, and even U.S. museums have historically given more attention to European movements of the 1920s, such as French surrealism and Russian constructivism, than to what was happening with black artists in their own cities. A new exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art called The Harlem Renaissance and Transatlantic Modernism is out to correct the record. Curated by Denise Morell, it places the explosion of creativity and experimentation by black artists from the 20s to the 40s at the center of the international art conversation in these years. The 160 works on view range from figures like Archibald J. Motley and Jacob Lawrence, whose works have long been celebrated, to a host of less familiar names, whose stories I frankly did not know at all before this show. There's so much to say about it, and I can't recommend seeing it enough. To get some perspective on what makes this show such a big deal, I talked to Bridget Cooks. Cooks teaches art history and African-American studies at the University of California, Irvine, and is the author of Exhibiting Blackness, an important 2011 book about the history of U.S. museums' relation to black artists. Cooks also happens to be one of a star group of experts who was on the advisory committee for this Met show. With the Harlem Renaissance and transatlantic modernism drawing major attention, I talked with her about both the history of the Harlem Renaissance itself and the history of how museums have treated the subject in the past. Bridget Cooks, thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited to talk to you. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me to tell you all about this great show. Yeah, well, I wanted to talk to you about this show and the Harlem Renaissance and where this show sits in the history of the reception and the scholarship around the Harlem Renaissance, because you have also written this great book, Exhibiting Blackness, that is about the history of the inclusion and exclusion of black artists from the museum. So I thought it would make an interesting conversation. You are on this exhibition's advisory committee with a bunch yes. of other scholars. Out of curiosity, what is that process like? What does that entail? Yeah, this was a real delight to be invited to be part of the Exhibition Advisory Board. I'm a huge fan of Denise Murrell, who was the Tisch Curator at Large at the Met, and have been following her career since her groundbreaking Posing Modernity exhibition right. that broke all previous attendance records at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. So when she told me she was doing this exhibition about the Harlem Renaissance at the Met and asked me to get involved, I was just almost teary, honestly, because I'm so excited about her work, her position, and there is such wonderful poetry to finally having an exhibition of art about the Harlem Renaissance from the Harlem Renaissance artists at the Met after the Met's really troubled history with accepting and understanding the work of Black artists. So what I was able to contribute was feedback on an already excellent premise that Mural had put together. The focus of her exhibition is to look at the Harlem Renaissance artists really internationally. So focus on the U.S., but then looking at the kinds of engagements that these artists had with European modernists and putting those works in conversation. So I'm part of a sort of all-star team of people I admire and have admired for many years who are on this advisory board. And then I also contributed to the exhibition catalog. Yeah, you have 
a short essay in the catalog called The Harlem Renaissance in Exhibition about the history of shows in museums about the Harlem Renaissance. And it's an important fact that it's a short essay because it's a surprisingly short history. I mean, in a way, this show is a big deal because according to your essay, there have only really been three survey shows about this very important period in art, which looms so large in the cultural imagination. Right. I was asked to do an essay about the exhibition history because of the book you mentioned, Exhibiting Blackness, African-Americans in the American Art Museum, in which I'm really interested in institutional histories and the politics of representation of the work of Black artists. So you are right. Surprisingly, there have only been, it's actually four exhibitions. And I wanted to mention one of the exhibitions that I accidentally omitted from the catalog essay. I wasn't made aware of it until later, but there are four exhibitions. The first was called Harlem Renaissance, Art of Black America from 1987. That was produced at the Studio Museum in Harlem by Mary Schmidt Campbell and the late David C. Driscoll. There was the exhibition Rhapsodies in Black, Art of the Harlem Renaissance from 1997, started in London at the Hayward Gallery and then traveled throughout the United States at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Corcoran. And that was organized by Richard Powell and David A. Bailey. And then the Oklahoma City Museum of Art in 2009 had an exhibition called Harlem Renaissance, and it showed work from the 20s and 30s and as late as 1997, looking at work by contemporary artist Faith Ringgold and how she has represented the Harlem Renaissance in her art. And it also included photographs of African-American people in Oklahoma City from the Harlem Renaissance era. And then the fourth exhibition was called I Too Sing America, the Harlem Renaissance at 100. And that was produced by the Columbus Museum of Art in 2018. So these are the big survey exhibitions. And it seems like every generation or almost generation has an exhibition that introduces them to this period. It's still, for many people, something that's unfamiliar to them. And there are people who really don't think about a history of African-American artists. They just think about more modern and contemporary artists like Basquiat or Mm -hmm. Kara Walker and think that these are first artists, but certainly they aren't. So it's really important to have these shows to introduce them to this larger movement. And then In between these group exhibitions, there have been solo exhibitions of particular artists like Archibald Motley or Aaron Douglas that really do a great job looking at a larger treatment of the work of singular artists. But it's great to see a whole community of people and different frameworks to introduce their work to the public. So I think that the term Harlem Renaissance looms large for people, but Yeah, in a certain sense, it has not always been included in the main line of the art history that people get taught about American art in the 20s and 30s. And before we get into maybe talking a little bit about what the Harlem Renaissance was and represented at the time and now, there is a certain kind of significance to this show being at the Met, which you already alluded to and that you talk about in your book. So maybe let's just start there because the Harlem on my mind affair, even though it is from 1968, still looms so large that it's actually mentioned in the press release for this show itself in 2024. Yeah, absolutely. So in 1969, the Met organized and presented an exhibition called Harlem on my mind, cultural capital of black America, 1900 to 1968. And this exhibition is considered the first blockbuster art exhibition in the United States. 
It was the first exhibition the Met did that focused on the contributions of African-American people. And it was the first and only exhibition it did that didn't include any art. Now, none of that makes any sense, right? But the first footnote I'll provide is that the exhibition was full of photography. And in the late 60s, photography was largely not considered an art form. It was considered images produced by a machine. I mean, still, when you go to libraries, photography is not in the art section. It's in the technology section. And so there were many artists who we will see in the exhibition at the Met this month who were painters and sculptors and printmakers as well as photographers, but most of their work was not considered to be important enough, significant enough, notable enough to be in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So the Harlem On My Mind exhibition was a real slight against African-American creativity. And the exhibition was full of really photo murals that were presented in different sort of innovative ways, enlarged, put on walls, put in these sort of box sculptural forms hanging from the ceiling. It had a big audio presentation where you could watch and hear people through a live feed from a corner in Harlem. So there was this sense of surveillance that went along with it. And the organizers of the exhibition really wanted to present their idea of Harlem. They were very open about that. And they rejected any help by the great Romir Bearden, artist, collagist, author, who repeatedly contacted the organizers at the Met to say, you really need to do an exhibition that reflects the desires of the community and also includes the art by the artists in Harlem because you're one of the greatest art museums in the world and you're doing a show about Harlem. But those calls fell on deaf ears. And so it's been a very controversial exhibition, a kind of counterexample of what you shouldn't do when you are creating an exhibition focused on the art of Black people. You know, you think about that mantra, nothing about us without us. And so this is the quintessential example of how that was done poorly in the history of American art museums. Right. So is there a strange, strange show that provoked a lot of activism and a lot of conversations about yeah, who gets to speak for Harlem, who gets to speak for Black artists, and what the status of art by Black artists in the museum? We should turn now to the subject of this show. So this is a very big, ambitious show. Let's just begin with the basics. You know, what is the Harlem Renaissance? What was the context for the art in this show? Like most artistic movements, they don't have specific beginning and end dates. There's sort of a spirit of creativity and desire that leads to its emergence and then to its end. Having said that, and because I am a professor, I do give my students dates. I mark the period of the Harlem Renaissance as being between 1919, which was the ending of American participation in World War I, and then ending in 1929 with the beginning of the Great Depression and the stock market crash. And yet before those dates and after those dates, there is a spirit of Black identity, Black creativity, Black self-fashioning that continues into the 1930s, specifically with the Works Progress Administration. You know, one of the reasons why I marked this break in 1929, in addition to the stock market crash, is that the source of funding changed for Black artists. With the Great Depression, they didn't have the same access to white patronage, but the government through the WPA offered funding for all artists to create a kind of new American art. But we also, in almost all of the exhibitions that I've mentioned, and certainly in Murrell's exhibition at the Met, we see examples of art that continue past the 20s, past the 30s, We go as far as the 1960s and a work by Romir Bearden in the current show to really show that influence of 
a sense of pride and creative expression that really, we think about the Harlem Renaissance and focusing on this particular neighborhood in uptown Manhattan, but we have artists who were not in Harlem, who were in San Francisco, who were in Chicago, who were in Jamaica, who were also caught up in part of this movement of a kind of emergence or blossoming of Black creativity and a real celebration of a new international modern subject. And that's the renaissance. That's the rebirth that we have in mind when we think about the Harlem Renaissance. Another term that's used as well is the new Negro movement. And those are interchangeable in many ways. The term the Harlem Renaissance is not necessarily what people called it at the time. I think Langston Hughes called it Manhattan's Black Renaissance. But -hmm. also, like you said, and this show focuses on, had a much wider spiritual center of gravity. Yes, absolutely. So what kind of themes do people associate with the Harlem Renaissance? I think a lot of people will know the poetry of Langston Hughes. But in visual art, what are we thinking about here? I think about... First, portraiture. Portraiture is a theme, a form that everybody can relate to. And yet portraiture was so important for African-American people at this moment in the 20th century. So we have photographers that are actually lighting Black people correctly so that you can see the variety of skin colors from blue, black to ivory white, all the colors, the full spectrum that we come in, you know, working with the limited calibration of film to be able to show that kind of range and diversity of who Black people are. We also have amazing portraits. An important artist that's featured in this exhibition is Laura Wheeler Waring, who... Right, amazing work, yeah. Amazing work. And Murel has found some images, some paintings of her work with the family that have not been seen perhaps ever or certainly within our lifetime. So, you know, we're still making discoveries in this revisiting of the Harlem Renaissance. And she made, in particular, beautiful portraits of Black women. And the significance of that was as important then as it really is today. I mean, trying to show the value and appreciation of the diverse beauty of Black women is something that was a real feature in her work as a Black woman painter at the time. We can also think about genre scenes. So everyday life, particularly everyday life of a international, even Parisian, cosmopolitan Black subject. And I think about this in the work of Archibald Motley, who was based in Chicago. And he made really exciting paintings of nightlife in Paris and also in Chicago that give us a real sense of that kind of spiritual movement, a kind of character and a look at the different kinds of diverse people that were part of Black America at that time. Yeah, something I think about when I look at Motley's nightlife scenes and these portraits of performers and artists that are very characteristic of the Harlem Renaissance period is, you know, I think it's significant that the high point of the Harlem Renaissance is the 1920s, which is also sometimes called the jazz age. You know, and jazz being the great Black musical idiom that had this international resonance at that time. And now people talking about this is America's classical music. And there was a sense that it was black culture was considered to be the mark of modernity in some ways. Those themes really come through in this art. Yes, I agree. And going back to one of your earlier questions about what was the Harlem Renaissance, The music and the literature and the theater, particularly through the work of Josephine Baker, is more well-known than the visual arts. And so that's another reason why these exhibitions are so important, because there are people who are aware of the cultural productivity and those other forms, but not in the visual arts. And, you know, one of the reasons why there was this enthusiasm and real motivation to 
have this diverse expression of Black creativity had to do with the reception of jazz music in Paris, particularly because of World War I bands who were playing in France and they were finally getting the audiences that they deserved, who were really interested in what they were doing, who were treating them like full human beings and really saw them as the avant-garde. And then when they came back to the U.S., the U.S. had to try to reconcile their previous ideas and to sort of catch up with an appreciation that was already understood abroad. So that's also part of the spirit of this movement. Yeah, yeah. There's this idea of the new Negro. And of course, newness is this huge obsession of the 1920s. Also, the new woman is a phenomenon of that era. So there's this spirit of modernity in a lot of these portraits it's kind of art deco in one of the catalogs. Someone calls it, I think, Afro deco. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but then also there's this conjugation of themes from African art. Laura Wheeler Waring did some amazing prints for W.B. Du Bois's magazine, The Crisis, in 1924, yes. that are these dynamic art deco silhouettes, but are also conjuring Egyptian motifs that are just amazing to look at. Yes. You know, another artist who was involved in creating a kind of African-American visuality of the time is Aaron Douglas. Right. And he, along with Vinehold Rice, were the illustrators of the 1925 book, The New Negro, which was published and edited by Alain Locke. And this was really the Bible. It is the Bible of the Harlem Renaissance. And it's an edited volume that has music, poetry, a play, and also critical commentary by Locke in particular, where he's talking about kind of prescribing what he thinks Black artists should be doing, how they can visualize themselves for their own community and for others, what this new cosmopolitan subject is. And he also prescribes what the relationship should be between African-American artists and African sculpture. And Aaron Douglas is the main illustrator who tries to create what that influence will look like. So he brings in his perception of Egyptian forms with African-American subject matter, looking at the style of silhouettes, a kind of art deco, decorative art that brings an overall style to the work. Just to say, I mean, in your capsule history of the exhibitions of the Harlem Renaissance, it seems like Aaron Douglas's Aspects of Negro Life is like the work that recurs again and again as sort of symbolizing this moment in exhibition. So these are paintings on canvas. It's a series of four paintings called Aspects of Negro Life. They're owned by the Schomburg Library in Harlem, which is, you know, the branch of the New York Public Library that focuses on people of African descent. They have this one-of-a-kind art collection. And when you go into the reading room, they're just above you, on the walls above you. It's just incredible that you can walk into this public space and see these works. They're often on loan because of how important they are. And in this sequence, as an expert draftsperson, Aaron Douglas really created a way to understand the values of life for West African people, the values of life for Africans who were enslaved along that journey. And then he looks at their values and their context once they're in the new world. And he tells a story from African origins through formal emancipation, through these really wonderful limited palettes lavenders and purples and browns and oranges, a series of concentric circles that appear in each canvas, and then focusing on these Black men and women through silhouettes, looking at the kind of labor that they did, their aspirations, their musical talent, their way of forming community. There's a lot of information in these canvases, and they're absolutely central to the Harlem Renaissance. But I've been delighted to see that they've been part of different kinds of exhibitions about modernism, that he's not just in exhibitions that are about him as a solo artist or the Harlem Renaissance, but that his work really resonates with different kinds of themes, and particularly for Black people internationally.
Before we move on, I want to just linger on Elaine Locke for a second, because like you said, his two publications actually in 1925, yes. Harlem Mecca of the New Negro and The New Negro, an interpretation, kind of help create a self-conscious sense of a, a movement. And he's a really interesting person. So maybe just speak a little bit more about who Elaine Locke was. Alain Locke was the first Rhodes Scholar who was African-American. He was also in the Department of Philosophy at Howard University and had a kind of contentious relationship with the folks in the art department. He was not part of the art department, but really was a philosopher who was imagining this new Negro Renaissance. And he was also a very savvy business person. He connected with different white organizations that were interested in helping, however, in really patronizing ways, African-American people, and was able to get them to invest their funding to support travel, so that these African-American artists could go and study in Europe, which is, and probably still is, part of a kind of development of an artist to go see, you know, the great masterworks. And he was a real interesting character. I mean, he was very much invested in the development and the success of African-American people. And he was an intellectual he imagined a kind of interracial future. He had a major vision for what he wanted to be an African-American school of art. And he wanted Henry Oswald Tanner, the great 19th century and 20th century painter, to be the leader of that school. But Tanner had already expatriated from the United States and was enjoying a kind of racial freedom abroad. Many of these African-American artists who were younger, who were part of the Harlem Renaissance, would really go to Paris to meet Tanner and sort of sit at his feet, as we say, and, and learn from him to find out more about his wisdom and to have some advice and direction for how they could be an African-American artist. Yeah, well, that gets at the transatlantic modernism part of the title, right? Which you already spoke about a bit. Yeah, Locke studied at Oxford and in Berlin and encouraged people to travel and study. And I think a focus of this show is Harlem Renaissance as being bigger than Harlem, or definitely in dialogue with the world far beyond Harlem. And yeah, a number of these figures, these artists, weren't necessarily working in New York or even the United States. Like you were saying, there is this post-World War one moment where because of the racism of the United States and the segregation of the art world, find a greater freedom in Europe. Yeah, so Tanner is part of that group of expatriates. And before that, we can think about Edmonia Lewis, a great neoclassical sculptor from the U.S. who worked in Rome. And then, you know, really, I mean, I want to say through today, we have a whole pattern of African-American artists who can have different kinds of opportunities and receptions in a European context. It's not the land of milk and honey. For African-American people, you'll find discrimination and stereotypes no matter where you go. But there were kinds of opportunities and differences in perception of who Black people were, what they could offer, how they should be treated. That was apparently very different in France in the 1920s than it was in the U.S. You know, we have to also think about the fact that many museums in America would not allow Black people to go into the doors. So you have a limited amount of access that emerging artists had to that history, to be able to observe art history, to observe the artworks, to do sketches even in the buildings to spend time. And you didn't have those same kinds of restrictions when you were working abroad, especially when they had funding to go abroad. They were able to have their own spaces with studios to be introduced to great European artists. Some of them really served as mentors. And then others, as we will see, as I will learn more about when I see the exhibition, were really contemporaries, people who were working alongside these artists who were coming from New York, but Chicago and Jamaica and all kinds of different places in the U.S. Yeah. And I mean, I guess it's a little bit of a mixed blessing because there's this huge hunger for Black performers in Europe and in the United States. I mean, the pilgrimage up to Harlem became a thing for sophisticated mm -hmm. 
folks in New York. You know, this is the machine age and kind of increasingly industrial society. And in some ways, black culture was being brought in as sort of less alienated. Josephine Baker, who's high Harlem Renaissance period figure in the mid-1920s when she's mm. really um, transfixing Paris. It's kind of an interesting, maybe sometimes uncomfortable dialogue between these opportunities and the role it's being asked to play. It's a really fascinating aspect to this cultural moment because you have these desires by white people who want to experience Blackness as defined by them after World War I. They want to sort of get back in touch with their um, primitive natures, right? And they look at Black people as a way to experience that. There's still stereotypes about all people of African descent, that somehow we are closer to nature, we haven't quite evolved as much as people of European descent, that we really know how to be of the body and and not of the mind. So, you know, all African-American people are different people, different individuals, different ideas, different abilities. But it was known at this time that you could be paid for fulfilling some of these desires. So we have clubs in Harlem, such as the Cotton Club, where we have very light-skinned Black women dancers, but the clientele are all white. These are not clubs Black people are patronizing for the most part. After hours, there were some differences where Black people could go in and be a part of these celebrations and performances. And we can't think about Josephine Baker fulfilling primitive stereotypes that made her a very rich woman while she was performing on stage. And we think about her in the banana skirt and being double jointed, doing all kinds of incredible things with her body. But when she was off stage, she did not dress in these costumes. She was incredibly dignified. I mean, I don't even know what the best phrase is. High class, hook couture. I mean, she was just an exceptional performer, but had a very clear distinction between who she was as a person and the characters that she performed on stage. The audiences were not always good at making those distinctions. They thought that African-American people came out of the womb singing and dancing and smiling and happy and half naked, if not completely naked, for the pleasure of white viewers. But African-American people knew then, as they knew before and as they know now, that There's a lot of code switching and that there are ways that you can present yourself in order to pay the rent that are not true to really who you see as yourself in the fullness of who you are. So an unexpected character to me in the story of the early Harlem Renaissance and one that you've written about extensively is the Harmon Foundation, which Elaine Locke was associated with. What was the Harmon Foundation and what influence did it have on the Harlem Renaissance? So William E. Harmon was a real estate mogul in New York, and he connected with Alain Locke, who presented him with this project of thinking about the future of Negro American artists. And Harmon had lots of money. He was a very wealthy man, and he was interested in a certain kind of way that he could get involved with uh, social progress. And he funded all kinds of different kinds of projects, not exclusively art projects, but he was particularly swayed by this idea of helping to develop a future for African-American art and culture. So he founded a foundation called the Harmon Foundation in 1921. And this foundation sponsored a series of exhibitions that happened between 1926 and 1933. These were competitive exhibitions where Black artists could show their art and then there would be prize winners. And the highest prize came with funding that the artists used to travel to Paris. There are really wonderful ephemera catalogs that show us what the works were that were in the exhibitions. It produced a kind of record for us to learn from so that we could see who was working, which paintings they felt were their best work, where they were exhibited, who came to see those shows. 
and how Elaine Locke really worked his magic socially to try to get white funding to support the work of these Black artists. It's not without controversy. I mean, uh, in your book, you quote Romare Bearden, the great artist. He's talking about the Harmon Foundation. It has encouraged the artist to exhibit long before he has mastered the technical equipment of his medium. By its choice of the type of work it favors, it has allowed the Negro artist to accept standards that are both artificial and corrupt. What did he mean? What was the criticism? (laughs) I know. It's so great. You know, Bearden was such a wonderful direct person. He was so incredibly talented. He was a baseball player. He was a math major at NYU. He was an author. He was trained as a social worker. And he has influenced multiple generations of artists. He was a wonderful critic of the Harmon Foundation and what was going on in the 1930s for African-American artists. One of the things that he really criticized this era for was having a lack of honest criticism about the work of Black artists. Now, all artists need feedback, right? They need crits. They need opportunities to show their work. Trusted people who have their best interests, who will be willing to spend time with the work and have conversations with the artists. We didn't have that infrastructure for Black artists in the 1920s and 30s. And without providing a support network for artists to get feedback, to develop their ideas and improve their artwork and really explore the visions that they have for what they can do, the artwork is not its best, right? You don't have all of that nurturing that needs to be in place for that development. And so Bearden was aware of this and he felt like there were artists that were trying to support themselves, trying to get some attention, trying to get some funding from the Harmon Foundation. And we're showing work that wasn't quite ready yet. And I just wanted to say that that's something that I took away from your book when I first read it. I think that's a really sometimes overlooked point because people talk about discrimination functioning by exclusion, but a very consistent criticism from Black artists from this period up to the present is also not taken seriously. You can't get an honest review. You can't get an honest review and you can't get a review in the art section of the newspaper. You can be mentioned in the section that's kind of about interesting daily news or novelties, where it's like, here's something curious, a Black person who says that he's a painter. It's this kind of sensationalist headline more than a serious review and acknowledgement of the work of a particular person. So that's what we're seeing in the 1920s and 30s. One of the things that Bearden talks about in addition to that is some of the offensive ways that African-American artists were shown. So he talks about an exhibition in California that combined the work of Black artists with the work of artists who were blind. And it's like, well, now what is the connection between being blind and being Black? And I haven't found any information about that particular exhibition. I don't know what the premise of the show was, but certainly there wasn't a justification for that pairing for Bearden. And he calls out this unfair treatment and perception of Black artists at the time. Well, maybe that can bring us to the Palmer C. Hayden, the controversy over the janitor who paints his 1937 painting. In your book, you talk about it was very difficult to get shows by Black artists in museum. The Harmon Foundation in 1939 sponsors this show or is part of the show at the Baltimore Museum of Art. Yes. Contemporary Negro Art. And interestingly, Elaine Locke wrote both the forward to the catalog and reviewed the show quite (laughs) critically. So it's a fascinating show that did inspire some controversy. So maybe let's talk about that. So Paul Mercy Hayden is another just wonderful character from the Harlem Renaissance. And I do want to say for people who are interested in knowing more about him, there's a really wonderful article by my colleague, John Ott, titled Labored Stereotypes, Palmer Hayden's The Janitor Who Paints. And it appears in American Art Journal in 2008. 
And what's so interesting is that Palmer Hayden, like many African-American artists and many artists then and now had other kinds of jobs, were not able to support themselves solely on their art. He was a janitor. He had other kinds of jobs or what they would call odd jobs, jobs that he could get to support himself. And he was trying to break through. He was trying to win Harmon Foundation competitions, and he did. But he made this painting called The Janitor Who Paints that shows either himself or it's a rendition of his friend, Cloyd Boykin, who was another African-American painter at the time, could be a hybrid of the two. But it shows this Black man with a beret on painting in his basement a mother and child. And what we see is a whole scene in which there is a broom, there is a mop, the trash can. It's clear this is not a formal studio. And we have also two versions of the painting. So there's one canvas It was shown in one way in the 1939 Contemporary Negro Artist Show that the Baltimore Museum of Art held. And then it was painted over after that time. And so the way that it looks now is different. What Hayden did was to change some of the markers of the characters in the painting that really bordered on racial stereotypes. So there was a kind of exaggeration of the eyes and the mouth of the baby. There was a picture on the wall behind the mother and child of Abraham Lincoln. Later that becomes a cat. There was a way in which the shape of the head of the painter resembled a fang reliquary sculpture. And then that is changed for the final version. And one of the things that we wonder about is why there were these stereotypes in the original version of the painting and why they changed. And one of the arguments that comes out of asking these questions has to do with Hayden's awareness of a perception of Blackness by white patrons that he was fulfilling in the first iteration of the painting stereotypes and desires for many white people to understand the novelty of these Black artists who are really primitive Africans in their soul. And then he changed that to be a more cosmopolitan image, maybe an image that more closely aligned with the way that he saw himself in his community. So there's the possibility of a kind of code switching, I'll use that term again, or double speak, right? A way in which he's showing, I know this is how they see us. Even the title of the painting, right? The janitor who paints, there is no particular name. Right. He's not considered an artist. It's the way that the media represents his work and the work of his colleagues in the press as it's, he's really a janitor. Don't be fooled. He's not really an artist. He's just a laborer. So if I understand it, there's almost an interpretation of this first iteration of the painting, which people found offensive, that it's almost like he's like pushing it back. He's like saying, is this how you see me? Right. As the janitor who paints for these kind of stereotypical features. But it's interesting that it remains so ambiguous, which maybe reflects like the ambiguous space there was to speak freely Yes, I think that's right. When you look at the larger body of work by Hayden, you know, there's these beautiful seascapes. He was interested in more traditional themes that you would find in European still lives. But he seemed to take an approach of, I will show you a still life, right? I will show you that I can be a part of these traditional themes and content of art, but I'm going to put an African sculpture in there and I'm going to put a cigarette in there as well. And so you'll see that also connecting with my ancestors by having a sculpture in there. And I'm also this modern subject who smokes. This is the kind of work that was really celebrated in these interracial settings. But once he got to Paris after he won the Harmon Foundation competition, then he didn't do those kinds of things anymore. It's like he wanted to prove to them, I can do the things that you expect me to do. I can channel my ancestors, even though I've never met them and I've never been to Africa. But I will put that in the painting because this is what Elaine Locke is prescribing. This is what the Harmon Foundation will reward. 
And that will put me in a position to do other kinds of things I really want to do as an individual. If there's one artist that people probably think of, or one painter that people think of, of the Harlem Renaissance, it's probably Jacob Lawrence. So it was interesting to me to be reminded reading about this show in your book that he really got his big career break from this show in the late 1930s, well after, you know, the 1920s period mm-hmm. we think of most with uh, Harlem Renaissance. He's just 21 when he's included in this show at the Baltimore Museum and gets all this critical acclaim for his portrait of Haitian revolutionary leader Toussaint Louverture. So I guess talk about Jacob Lawrence a little and his role in the Harlem Renaissance and how his person kind of got taken up by the wider culture. He was really too young to be part of the Harlem Renaissance in the sort of 10-year period that I identified earlier. But as a young person, he was almost a mature artist. His style of using largely primary colors with browns to make these narrative sequence paintings with multiple panels, his interest in Black history with Toussaint Louverture and then specifically African-American history. His conceptions of the work that he was meant to do were so complete and clear that it's still very impressive. So he makes these paintings about the story of Haitian revolutionary Toussaint Louverture that appears in the Contemporary Negro Artists exhibition. And then he really gets his big break when he's part of the Coast Guard. He is an official artist for the U.S. military. And then he has an exhibition of a series of works about the history of African-American people that opens at MoMA in 1942. And he becomes the second Black artist to have a solo exhibition at MoMA. So he's someone that was really a child of the Harlem Renaissance. We see him making work, you know, through the 1980s and 90s. You know, that kind of legacy, it dates back certainly to the Harlem Renaissance, but I think that spirit of Jacob Lawrence has gone on, you know, multiple generations, even so that you and I can both share the way that he's been influential. His work is still very much celebrated. There's a way in which his compositions and forms are simplified. They're distilled and they're very powerful in that way. There's a way through his style that he can communicate very heavy ideas and emotional weight in these really simplified forms of Black figures. So there's still so much to learn from him and his process of working, his love of history, his love of people, his love of teaching. So if people don't know about Jacob Lawrence, they certainly should. And they will also discover other artists, many who are lesser known through the exhibition. So this is a very exciting show. Are there any figures that you've discovered through the show that you'd like to point people towards or specific parts of the show that you'd like to point people towards? We'll point people towards the work of Laura Wheeler Waring because there's going to be some new discoveries in the exhibition. There's also a number of European artists whose names I didn't know at all that are in the exhibition that I'm looking forward to discovering. And it's really through Murrell's incredible research and, you know, dogged digging, really, to find some of these new works. There's work by Henri Matisse that's in the show. This may be the first time that we've seen him as part of this idea of transatlantic modernism in relationship to the Harlem Renaissance. Kaim Soutin is in the show. William H. Johnson is another Black artist that many people may have heard of before they walk into the exhibition. I mean, this might sound kind of hokey, but I'm excited about the kind of energy that we're going to feel when we're actually in these galleries with these works together in this particular configuration and list of inclusion for the first time. I think it's just going to spark a whole new generation of research. It's going to spark some resentment, I think, rightfully so, by viewers who will wonder why I didn't know about all of this before. Many of these people are college educated. Some of them have studied art history, but this was not something that they learned about. I tell my students, I don't teach any classes I ever took. All of the research that I have benefited from conducting, I did on my own to try to change the way in which we learn 
art history. And so I can see this as a pattern that will happen for future generations and the impact of this exhibition will be part of that development of the field. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Bridget Cooks, for this discussion. It's given me so much to talk about and I'm even more excited to see the show. I am too. Yeah. Thank you. That's it for this week's episode. If you like what you've heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, please take a moment to rate and review our show. It helps other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. 